for our news coverage tonight, we're going to show you some clippings taken from the network television news of the, quote, discovery of the Russian troops in Cuba. And we will show you the way that the television network news handled, covered, and interpreted this event and the political ramifications and how they were covered. Then we will discuss with John if indeed the full story was told on network news of the Cuban-Russian relationship. And we will also see what distortions there were in the television coverage. And we'll let John comment and give another interpretation of the political implications of this uh, so-called event. Cuba is obstructing the Senate's work on SALT, the budget, and military planning. As a result, the administration is negotiating with both the USSR and the U.S. Senate. According to congressional sources, both negotiations are serious. With Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin, and with Senate leaders, serious and intricate. Politics on Cuba are more murky in the Senate than in the Kremlin. The administration must strike one deal with the Soviet Union, but many deals here with Sam Nunn demanding a 5% increase in U.S. military spending before he will vote for SALT II. But Cuba has frozen SALT II. The administration must negotiate with Frank Church, who says no SALT until all the Soviet combat troops leave Cuba. Carter can make no deal with the Soviet Union about the troops without dealing with powerful Scoop Jackson, who wants troops and jets and submarines out before he'll consider SALT. And he won't even do that without a 5% military budget increase. That brings Carter into entirely new negotiations with budget chairman Muskie, who opposes any major spending increase. And according to the White House press secretary, decisions were made about how to deal with the problem posed by those Soviet combat forces in Cuba. There was no further public comment on the nature of those decisions. However, here is a report from our White House correspondent, Sam Donaldson. President Carter may decide to counter the Soviet combat presence in Cuba, by stepping up an American military presence, both in the Caribbean and elsewhere in the world. Unless, of course, the Soviets take steps on their own to change the status quo as the president has demanded. No one here will confirm that such a decision is in the works, but the president's own words on this subject 10 days ago point to such an approach. We do have the right to insist that the Soviet Union respect our interests and our concerns if the Soviet Union expects us to respect their sensibilities and their concerns. Otherwise, relations between our two countries will inevitably be adversely affected. What the president was clearly saying was that if the Russians don't change the status quo by taking action themselves, the United States will change it through its own actions, not by provoking a warlike confrontation, but perhaps by stepping up U.S. combat forces in the Caribbean, which would serve to neutralize any possible threat from Cuba, and perhaps by challenging Soviet interest elsewhere, through a mix of military and economic moves that, while not directly threatening Moscow, would adversely affect Russian concerns. The president said one advisor is not going to paper over those troops. The status quo will be changed. Sam Donaldson, ABC News. In, uh, in Cuba. Now... What is brought out in bits and pieces, but not very well, by the media in covering this, by the statements that were quoted, is that it, th there was no threatening Soviet presence in Cuba. No one at any point pretended that the U.S. was a uh, national security was being jeopardized by a Soviet force that could invade Florida or Puerto Rico or anywhere else. It was a trivial uh, 2,000 men, approximately. Uh, the, a lot of semantics were played on whether or not they were combat troops. Uh, well, I would react by saying that they were, in fact, combat troops, but combat troops are also instructors. So the Soviets may be telling the truth there, but uh, they, they, they're infantry troops, but they are not assault troops. Even President Carter, in one of his speeches, admitted this. They didn't have... They, they do not have the delivery capability, the, the ships, airplanes, helicopters, however, to, to move from Cuba to Florida or Puerto Rico or somewhere else. They're not assault troops. They don't have an aggressive posture or capability. They don't have the weapons that would go with a, an assault unit. Uh, the press dramatized this issue by talking, uh, and you, you notice these commentators, the, the drama that they would get in their voices where they would say, Soviet troops in Cuba, you know, and it makes you want to sit up and, and get nervous. If they had said, 
this tiny Soviet force in Cuba every time they brought it up or something like that. It would have put it into its true perspective. Something else. Well, John, do you think they manufactured the story then that we've known that there have been Soviet troops in Cuba since 1962? Definitely. There were something like 40,000 troops at that time, and most were withdrawn. But there's been two or 3,000 troops there continually. The whole time. And, and Vance is the Secretary of State's first, the, fr the administration's first announcement of this as being an issue, objected to the status quo. He did not object to the introduction of Soviet troops into Cuba. He said the status quo is unacceptable because he knew that the Soviets knew and the Cubans knew that we knew that they had been there the whole time. There but was nothing new about this issue. The only thing that was new was the Non-Aligned Nations Conference happening. Right, but did the media adequately point out that no new cute Russian troops were actually recently placed in Cuba? Didn't they give the impression from the news clippings that this was something new, something threatening, oh. something dangerous, as if Russia had recently put a whole flock of new troops there that suddenly Certainly. posed a threat? Certainly so this is, this is really distortion of the grossest... Um, Magnitude, magnitude because it's, it's exercising the American people it's jeopardy there he, he said they were not assault troops but they were there for training and uh, certainly we have troops all over the world that are there to help install our, our and train and use our our military equipment the hardware we've installed we had for many years this huge unit in in Addis Ababa we have, have of course 5,000 troops on the Soviet border in Turkey uh, these troops uh, have no capability of invading Russia, for heaven's sake, but they are combat troops. They've all been trained in how to shoot rifles and whatnot. And I would say that uh, the only two people I saw in there who, who seemed to be candidly, uh, call three, I guess, calling it like it was, was uh, Senator Byrd, who said it was a non-crisis. Gromyko, who, who it appeared to me, called it like it was, said you're making something out of nothing for your own purposes. And then Fidel Castro, also calling it like it was. And and Andrew Young, also. And Andrew Young, yes. Y que nosotros llamamos centro de instrucción. And which we call training center. Está en Cuba. Desde hace 17 años. Has been in Cuba for the past 17 years. Esa instalación militar. Now then, that military facility fue creada al final de la crisis de octubre de 1960. Was established at the end of the October crisis in 1962. In 1962. Conforme al espíritu de los acuerdos. In conformity with the spirit of the agreements. De octubre de ese año. Signed on October of that year. Y dentro del statu quo establecido como consecuencia de la crisis. And within the status quo that was set up as a result of the October crisis. Yeah. Why has he brought this problem to the light now to create a situation? Porque el hecho de que esté en crisis Because la reducción de Carter. Because the fact that Carter's uh, situation is in a crisis. No le da derecho a poner en crisis. Does not give him the right paz. to place peace into a crisis. Y yo pienso que la actuación de Carter en relación a este problema. And I believe that Carter's behavior concerning sido, this problem ha sido has been dishonest, ha sido insincera, has been unsincere, ha sido immoral, has been immoral, y está a la and has been mundial, deceiving the world public opinion y a la de and the U.S. public opinion. Andrew Young bowed out as a diplomat, speaking his mind, as usual. Last night he spoke to 5,000 blacks, and at a time when the administration has been saying it's gravely concerned over those Soviet combat troops in Cuba, Young ridiculed the threat. If the Russians made a move against us, our defenses are strong enough to ignore and wipe out and obliterate some 3,000 Cubans and, I mean, Russians in Cuba. What the hell can they do to the United States of America? That is a totally irrelevant political issue that has nothing to do with the national security of this nation. More relevant, Young said, is inflation and unemployment, more of a threat than troops in Cuba. Then, Young philosophized about what he thinks is wrong with foreign policy. It's not some amorphous strategic concept decided by some folk that ain't never fought no wars, don't know nothing about suffering, never been poor, and essentially in isolate themselves 
in some ivory tower writing papers and theorizing to each other. Those are the folk. Those essentially are the folk that have created the mess that the world is now in. Andrew Young's beautiful comment. And the other people. On this one, also after the, um, the speech that Carter made where he outlined his plan, immediately the headlines in the 10 o'clock news were Russian troops to stay in Cuba as if Carter had not really done anything and had therefore failed to be a strong uh, leader. Well, isn't there a certain justice in that, though, because this, this whole thing started with an operation Brzezinski and the CIA juned up to embarrass Cuba and the Soviets. And, uh, but President, they work for President Carter. The, the, the CIA is part of the White House. And, and, and Carter uh, permitted it, apparently encouraged it, to be brought, brought out and made public and made into an international issue. And uh, in that sense, it's backfiring on him as a certain amount of justice. He had Secretary Vance make the, the statements and say, make an issue out of it, throw the gauntlet down, say the status quo is unacceptable. And the amateurishness of this administration was, was shown right then and there in that the status quo was unchangeable by the United States, except this, this very weak solution he came up with in the end that, well, we can't do anything about the Soviets in Cuba, so uh, we'll increase our own military activity around. You always wonder uh, how much something like this was planned ahead of time since it had so much of an effect of encouraging the hawks and leader, leading to greater military activity and spending, how much of it was, was uh, determined ahead of time? Let's, let's make an issue of the Soviet troops there so we can get into this defense spending. Particularly since they'd known about it for 17 years. Since they'd known about it for 17 years. Well, I noticed uh, frequently that they would toss around the CIA as well. We have good intelligence. I got a briefing by Stanfield Turner, blah, blah. They would be bringing it in as if that would automatically give the stamp of expertise on it. I was just in a briefing with Stanfield Turner, the head of the CIA, a few moments ago, and he believes that those troops are not there just uh, to train Cubans. However, we do not know the mission of those troops. Early this morning, National Security Council members, including CIA Director Turner and Secretary of State Vance, arrived to continue talks with the president, which went on here until late last night about Senator Baker's suggestion that the president now release intelligence photographs of the Soviet troops in Cuba. ABC News diplomatic correspondent Barry Dunsmore reports the State Department will oppose doing that while negotiations are still underway. But if the talks break down, release of the evidence might be a good idea. It's amazing how they would dare to do that when you have this history of incredible, endless intelligence failures by the CIA. In crisis after crisis after crisis, the CIA coming up with faulty or false information. And uh, for them to cite Stansfield Turner uh, in a situation like this, remember the last U.S.-Cuban confrontation where, where uh, President Carter was calling uh, President Castro a liar and vice versa was uh, a year and a half ago at the time the Katangis invaded the Shaba. And uh, President Carter said that we had intelligence that uh, it was a Cuban operation. And uh, Castro said it absolutely was not a Cuban operation, that it was Katangis and Cuba had nothing to do with it. And President Carter did much as they had there. He had CIA, you know, the CIA had information proving it. Eventually, it was resolved by some senators going down to Havana and meeting with Castro at his invitation, and he convinced them that there was reasonable doubt. And they went back and demanded and were shown the CIA's intelligence. And the 17 senators walked out of that meeting and said it didn't prove the, the presence of Cuba behind that invasion at all. In other words, in yet another situation, uh, President Carter uh, was not telling the truth. He was misinformed and he was distorting the information, lying, if you will. And, uh